Um, thank you all for joining in, both digitally as well as um, um, live um, here. Um, welcome you all at our Day of Experimental Archaeology. Um, we today have two lectures to present to you. Both are evolving um, around other projects um, that we have on site. One uh, being uh, our dugout canoe and transport project, um, where the Roscoe the Viking Boat Museum is a very good cooperation partner. Um, but that's the second lecture. And the other one is our Our Petal project, a project that not only evolves um, circles around um, grazing with cattle, um, but also the role of this wild bovine uh, in the early Middle Ages. But also we um, do research with uh, our ox specimen and found a great cooperation partner with University College Dublin, the ADNA lab, and Connor Rossi, um, which is writing his, his PhD thesis. Almost done, right? It's done. It's done, right. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> um, and he, he was able to use um, specimen um, and samples we've provided him with from the Upper Rhine Valley. And they um, have a very um, uh, interesting, unique preservation level um, when it comes to a &E, but um, that's what Connor is uh, about to um, tell us about now. So thank you all for joining in and uh, have a great um, next half an hour. We will do a Q&A session afterwards. Wir machen dann eine kleine Frage der Runde. Enjoy uh, the presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you very much, guys, for having me and and the town of Lourdes. It's, it's been a lovely day so far. And um, so, as guys was saying, I'm studying ancient DNA in Trinity College Dublin, and today I just want to bring you all through the field of ancient DNA right now and how. A collaboration between ourselves has led, has led to some discoveries about wild cattle in Europe. And um, I'll try to speak slowly. If anything is unclear, please um, put your hand up and we can have a discussion throughout the, throughout the presentation, but at the end as well, questions are very welcome. So uh, ancient DNA as a field has come a very long way. The first interaction for many of us with the concept of ancient DNA may have been from sci-fi movies like Jurassic Park where they took DNA out of a mosquito and in the mosquito was dinosaur DNA and they made dinosaurs from it and while that was in 1993 a very science fiction concept here we are in 2023 and we've sequenced DNA from a one million year old mammoth um, preserved in the permafrost. Now, unfortunately, dinosaurs won't happen. DNA doesn't last that long, but one million years is nothing to stop at. And we will discuss as the talk goes on what this might mean in, in real terms when we, when we think about biodiversity in, in our world, which has obviously gone down incredibly so in the last 10,000 to 30,000 years due to human interaction. Um, so with ancient DNA, first of all, a concept of a genome, okay? Um, for anybody who hasn't heard of this before, a genome, we all have our own genome. It's like an instruction manual that's inside your cells. And with it, it will tell you, do you have blue eyes, green eyes? Will you be tall or short? Will you go bald or not? So it really tells us everything about ourselves. And when we die, our DNA is kept in our, our bones, uh, our flesh as it begins to dissolve and decay, but it actually survives. And in recent years, we've been able to extract that DNA, decode it, so read it like a book, and come up with some discoveries about the past. So for example, the, in 2010, uh, Neanderthal genome, our closest relative in terms of species, was sequenced. And it was found that all non-African humans have some Neanderthal DNA in our genomes because there was interbreeding 
50,000 years ago when humans left Africa. Ancient DNA has told us about more recent history. For example, a colleague of mine sequencing genomes of a Neolithic uh, site in Ireland found that uh, a pharaoh or a king boy, a boy king who was who was buried in this was the result of a consanguous relationship. So a father, daughter, brother, sister. So it, it tells, it, ancient DNA can tell us about how society was structured. Even back, back then, 5,000 years ago, there was still the, may have been these concepts that, you know, um, incest, family relationships, not good for anyone except certain elite people. You can do it. It's also been able to tell us about how disease evolves and spreads, which of course, unfortunately, we are all too aware of in the last few years. And finally, it's also been able to tell us about the animals that we've domesticated. Uh, possibly the most important relationship um, humans have ever forged was between ourselves and our domestic animals. And we saw how, how they've shaped the landscape in, in this site here um, and how really they've, they've changed human history completely. So just a bit of a background on domestication of cattle. So cattle were first domesticated in the Fertile Crescent around 10.5 thousand years ago. So modern day Turkey, northern Syria is thought to be where they were first domesticated by humans. And when humans who were farmers moved out of Southwest Asia, so Turkey, into, into Europe, they brought their animals with them. So the four kind of core animal species they brought were cattle, sheep, goat, and pig. Um, but that wasn't the first time that um, cattle were in Europe. Actually, there were there were there was a whole population of wild cattle at the time. And you may uh, recognize this these paintings from Lascaux in France uh, depicting these wild cattle uh, that used to roam um, Europe in, in great numbers. Meanwhile, the, the cattle that were brought into Europe by farmers probably came from a very small group. So they're all very similar. Now, the aurochs are kind of unusual when we talk about wild animals uh, or domesticated animals because they're one of the few that actually have gone extinct now. There, there is no such thing as wild cattle anymore. And um, Whereas we do, we still have wild boar in Europe, we, there are still wild sheep and goats uh, that would be the ancestors of the domestic form. So with with farming, humans began to change the landscape in in a big way, and we've seen this today with the the plowing of the land. So as humans began to alter their environment, clearing forests for farmland, uh, this was actually removing the habitat of the aurochs. Meanwhile, humans also hunted wild aurochs. So this is kind of the, the last depictions of, of aurochs that are available. It would have been a, a great prize for hunters. If you got a, a, a successfully killed an aurochs, that meant you were a big deal. So it was in the 1600s, we're coming up to about 400 years ago, um, the last aurochs cow died. And with that last cow, went extinct, the wild form. So now we have some questions to address. Since we can look at uh, ancient DNA and look at what the aurochs were genetically, what do we need to know about them compared to our domestic cattle today? So the first question, were European aurochs different genetically to modern domestic cattle? Did the same European aurochs populations survive the Ice Age? So Ice Age happened uh, last 100,000 years 
uh, has been very cold actually in Europe just up until 10,000 years ago. So how did these animals that enjoy open grassland, uh, kind of temperate climate, how did they survive the ice age? And finally, if European aurochs are different to domestic cattle, has any European aurochs DNA survived in our breeds of, of cattle? So this is where the collaboration comes in. So this is, you may, may have seen, this is a different one, but it's an Ice Age Aurochs from the Rhine Valley. So it's, it's a local. Um, and this kind of preservation was, first of all, amazing to see, but doesn't necessarily mean that you will get DNA out of them. So what we do is people may have tried to find their own ancestry with 23andMe. The similar concept, I'm going to call it uh, 23 and Moo. That's kind of going down, but um, 23 and move. So to see what the, the genetics of this beast was compared to the, the breeds that we have today. What we do is we get suited up, like kind of like a sci-fi movie, extract the DNA, we sequence it. So that means we read it and decode it. And then we analyze it. We can compare it to modern uh, animals. So the preservation of the uh, Rhine Valley aurochs, which were, some of them were over 50,000 years old, so extremely old samples, but they had an amazing preservation. Up to 75% of the DNA was, was actually aurochs, which is, is a rare find even in specimens that are a few hundred years old. Usually when an animal dies, uh, microorganisms invade the, the bone. And so you're sequencing all this DNA, but all the DNA is just from bacteria that are in the soil. So usually, you know, if you get 5% from the actual animal, that would be a good thing. And we got up to 75%. So it was, it was really, really good. But the DNA was still very damaged. So very short. Uh, there's chemical changes to it as well. And that creates challenges when we're trying to compare modern to ancient. So this is where we come on to population genomics. And this is what I do. So looking at the variation in these animals and comparing them to the variation that we see today uh, in modern times. So something that is very commonly done is a PCA, popular, uh, principal components analysis. And this is basically summarizing all the genetic variation into one two-dimensional plot. And what you can see here is along this axis, we have domestic taurines. So they're the kind of cattle that we saw outside. We have Indocene, which are Indian cattle. They have a big hump on their back and a, a dewlap. Uh, and then we have some um, we have some hybrids in between. Meanwhile, these purple ones and these green ones are completely extinct. These are all ancient genomes, the triangles on the map. So they no longer exist. They've gone extinct. Uh, so yes, the European aurochs were different to the ones that we have today. Our, our, um, our cattle that we have in our fields are, are immigrants. They're actually Turkish, probably. Um, but when we also look at European aurochs, here we have Ice Age aurochs that we've gotten from the Rhine Valley. And we have the very last of the aurochs here. And you can see how close to, closely together their genomes look. So for at least 50,000 years, there was a population of animals here that were very similar genetically. And it was only when humans brought in domestic cattle and started to remove their habitats, start to overhunt them, did they go extinct and get replaced with these kind of yellow uh, dots here. But the question is, is there any European aurochs left in domestic taurine up to date? And when we actually look at that and start to try and uh, tease that apart, so the red on the map are those, those uh, Indian 
um, sorry, it might be kind of hard to see, is the kind of Indian variation. The yellow is the kind of, let's say, uh, fertile crescent domestic one. You might be able to see just little notches here and there of these different breeds that have wild European cattle in them. Uh, so that meant that as farmers were bringing these animals across, they didn't really let them breed too much with the locals, uh, but small parts. And when we really dig into it, it seems as though they allowed local bulls occasionally uh, breed with their domestic stock, uh, their domestic cattle. So maybe they let their cows into a field um, and allowed a, a local aurochs bull who was big and, and handsome to uh, interbreed with their own stock. Or maybe it was completely accidental and they didn't like this at all. Uh, because even seeing these cattle today, they were obviously not intact bulls, uh, quite easy to handle. That probably wouldn't have been the case with aurochs bulls, which were big, angry beasts that um, that people were were afraid of, and rightly so. So today, in our in some of our more majestic breeds like the Highland cattle, actually have the most amount of local wild uh, aurochs in them. And when when we kind of think about this in a bit of a deeper way, um. This is an image of, of European bison, which were at the brink of extinction. There was only a, um, a few dozen left in ca captivity, but they've been brought back and there are nature preserves now where they're growing in numbers, thankfully. It's a good news story. And there is a question of, can we rewild Europe with our, with our aurochs? in a similar way to what might happen with bison. Um, and there's been a lot of breeding pro programs to try and achieve this, this aurochs. And as you can see here, I don't think we're ever going to get back to a place where our, our 50,000 year old ice age aurochs are going to be living amongst us. But if we can get something that still acts like that, there's still mm -hmm. people of, of um, tending to the land in the way that Aurochs would have 50,000 years ago, in my opinion, it, it would serve the same purpose. Yeah. How close is the relation between bison and Aurochs? So uh, quite different. Uh, they split probably 2 million years ago, but you can still actually interbreed them. And today, European bison actually have some amount of cattle in them. So when they were kept in zoos, the last of them, there might be 5% of these bison have, have domestic cattle in them. Yeah, but quite different, but they can still produce fertile cows, not bulls. Yeah. So that's my talk. Um, if anybody has any questions about this or ancient DNA in general, I'd be really happy to answer. And thank you all for your attention. Yes, Anna, any question from your side? To Connor Rossi. Are there any um, any uh, comparisons to even more uh, uh, um, cattle in the world? E even uh, uh, is um, um, human made <laughs> or or wild wild forms uh, of, of more than that? The concept is good. Um, in terms of wild cattle, uh, no, that all all cat European aurochs gone. No, there's no wild. No, no wilds at all. Yeah, there might be feral, you know, the cows that have, <laughs> have taken upon themselves, but yeah, all extinct. Yep. Um, is this is Turkish cattle which we um, brought to Europe? Mm. Um, to show um, which origin they come from? From from Turkey, that they would have been a wild type in Turkey. A very different, which is. Is it, uh, Turkish, or, or is it the Turkish bison, or is, uh, uh, yeah, it, it would how, be. How does it come that, that they are more um, um, useful for breeding, more calm in, in, in temperament, or? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. It's it's not known why. For example, with we the two uh, pigs out there, I was talking to Trina about this. 
European pigs are actually from wild European boar. So they were domesticated first in Southwest Asia. So, sorry, one second. There. Sorry, can I just, can I just, oh, yes, yeah, sir. Uh, so, pigs would have been domesticated here, brought across Europe. Um, but as farmers were bringing them across Europe, they re domesticated the wild European boar with the cattle. They brought them from here, brought them all across Europe. But for some reason, they kept the same genetically. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, um, potentially it's because of the behavior of, of aurochs. As a really aggressive animal, to actually domesticate them probably was very difficult. So when it was done once, really wasn't done again. Whereas pigs are quite social, uh, they're scavengers, so they'll come to human settlements and, and eat the, the scraps might be easier to make a relationship with the pig and say, okay, you you stay here and you don't ram me and you know I'll give you food and then I'll eventually cook you, but that's okay. <laughs> with the aurox, you try to reason with a with a big bull horns in your face. I don't think the conversation would last very long. Uh, I mean what would you have to keep in mind is that aspect of working with these animals as draft animals is something completely different than keeping them in an enclosure um, to slaughter them eventually. Um, uh, but you have to closely interact with these animals. And if someone has done the great job of, well, taking the calves from an hour cow, um, then uh, tame them. And this doesn't mean that they will be tame all the time. And you have to select and this is a long process and then this is something that was done in european breeding for centuries that you also bred for character mm -hmm. for temperament this isn't done anymore because nobody selects animals um, for their character to work with them anymore uh, as i was saying outside we're about 60 to maybe 100 people in germany that still work with cattle mm -hmm. and if you want to find the right one um, it's not as easy as it was um, 50, 80, or 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think that process of domesticating cattle, having in mind uh, on a later stage um, to use um, not only the primary products, but also the secondary products, meaning draft power as well, um, meant that um, if you already have a, a running team, why change and start over, which is much harder and there are also animals that are much easier to tame. Um, I mean, look at wild parks everywhere. They have mostly tame wild boars there. They just come because they get fed. But uh, the moment you want to put a halter on the boar, <laughs> that would probably won't work, and it would not work with cattle too. So I think that also might have something to do with it. And with um, when we look at zebu in cattle, um, and they seem to be a little bit well or looking at a little bit more asia they look actually to be more um than some of our western breeds but it's not exclusively but it's it's a in a way something i that work with different breeds of cattle um has um yeah thought too well yeah maybe this, yeah known for which purpose first purpose for was it for milk or for for, for food for slaughtering or was it for um, working on the, on the, fields? the process or, of um uh the, the neolithic uh, era um is usually in, in research split in two parts there was the first domestication for the primary products that means everything that you get when you slaughter the animal and then um, in the fourth millennia, um, it's the so-called secondary product revolution, where they started dairy um, and more the work. Um, but when you start not um, to be um, moving around like nomads uh, and you start growing crops uh, and you change your lifestyle completely, then you need, in order to do it efficiently, in order to feed more, um, you can't do it all by hand. Um, and then at a certain point, the cattle came in. 
Mm -hmm. so but it wasn't right from the beginning. Some sites in, you know, the very earliest farming communities in Turkey would have uh, half and half. They would hunt aurochs, but potentially pin them into certain areas. So, so begin to restrict their movement and really domestication. It's, it's split again, some archaeologists would argue otherwise. But really, for me as a geneticist, I really think it's about controlling their their reproduction. So when do the farmers begin to castrate males because they're too they're too wild? When do they begin to put one ball in with these cows? That sort of thing. But it probably in Turkey anyway started as you said with meat. They would eat the the cow and then milk, wool for sheep came in later. What do you think, how realistic is um, Jurassic Park for um, good ancient DNA like um, the Aurochs mm -hmm. or, or something like that? Yeah, um, so it's something that people are working on, in, in particular um, with mammoths. It's, it's, there's a company which, which is actually investigating this. So currently we, with mammoths, with aurochs now, we have the complete genome. We know the whole manual of, of how to make one. The problem is how do you put that into, into a living thing? And that's the big change. But this discussion of, let's say with a mammoth, a mammoth is just really a hairy elephant. You know, there's, <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing of it. So if you could find within the mammoth, Oh, this is the gene that makes the elephant hairy. And this is the gene that makes it okay with, with cold weather. If you could put that into an elephant uh, genome or into a live elephant, is that a mammoth now? Why not? <laughs> but in terms of taking the information that we have now and, and making something, that's, that's not on the horizon right now. But Again, 30 years ago, the idea to even take the DNA out and, and get to this point was science fiction. So so who knows? The question really is, why would we do that? <laughs> because there are animals going extinct every day and we don't care about that. So rather than investing billions into trying to bring back a mammoth, maybe to try and save some animals that are near extinction right now is, is an okay idea. <laughs> You, you have one um, picture uh, with a rich in genetic origin, and it shows that um, our domesticated cattle is more uh, a greater relation to the Siberian, our ox, than to the uh, uh, European. Um, right. So, yeah, I'll bring that up here. Uh, Sorry, it's out of too many. <laughs> uh, yes, very keenly, keenly spotted. Uh, no, that's not the case. This can sometimes happen just with the, the program we're using. Um, in, in tests where I've actually tested the, the split, our, our modern day cattle with European cattle split maybe 50,000 years ago, whereas European and domestic chloride split from Siberia 100,000 years ago. Just because Siberian aurochs are equally related to these two, they, they sit in the middle there. So well spotted, but no, European and our modern cattle are closer related than Siberia. Yeah. Although you might have also seen in this slide that there are Siberian... Um, breeds today that have that wild and actually more wild than European. So there is that Siberian uh, variation captured in, in some breeds. Uh, Yakutian cattle are these cattle from Siberia that have really woolly coat and that might be a, a gene that was kind of captured. Are there any further questions now? If that's not the case, thank you very thank much. Thank you all for your time. We will have a break of 15 minutes now and then we'll resume to the next lecture.